So we left off on Monday uh, talking about super alloys. We sort of went through what the definition of a super alloy was and looked at the damage against the structure. Um, and today we're going to talk about uh, the hardenability and the strengthening of super alloys and what makes them so uh, exceptional at um, high temperature applications. So let's start by looking at the gamma matrix itself. And in addition to the precipitation hardening of gamma prime, we still, like all the other systems we looked at, can get significant solid solution strengthening uh, from elements that primarily are going to seg segregate into the into the gamma. And this just shows the the relative effect of titanium and vanadium being very potent solid solution strengtheners, right? Also remember that vanadium uh, can give you significant uh, additional strengthening through the formation of the gamma double prime phase, um, which we talked about briefly in certain alloys, right? So the, the relative effect of solid solution strengthening is here. And this has been used um, for design models, right? Um, for as if people are, are putting new alloys together to try and figure out what the relative change in flow stress in the gamma prime is going to be as a function of the uh, various alloying elements. Right, so the calculations here aren't uh, uh, super important. It's just sort of uh, of interest that people put these, put these models together. The key thing is just knowing sort of the relative effects of what the different, what the different alloying uh, elements are. Right. So, right again, this is just uh, sort of the same, the same information. Right, aluminum is the the key one. Right, normally added for uh, precipitation hardening purposes, but you get potentially significant effects out of it. Remember, what's the biggest bang for your buck you can get for solid solution strength? Right. What's the what's the combination of the properties that you would want for the best solid solution strength? Right. So go ahead. It's going to be a large misfit, but still go solid solution. Right. So there's a range of up to about fifteen percent that you can do, and the biggest difference in elastic modulus, you want a more compliant atom, right? Because remember, a larger atom is going to a, a stiffer atom is going to counteract the effect of the size misfit, right? Whereas a more compliant atom will, um, <coughs> will complement, right? So the biggest, the biggest size misfit, which with, and the biggest change in modulus with your solute atom being less uh, less stiff is going to give you your um, your greatest uh, contribution, right? So the solutes strengthening effects as we go up in temperature are going to be um, strongly affected by diffusion, right? So at temperatures uh, approaching melt, approaching the solvus, right? Things move around really easily, right? We're, we're talking in the range of 800 C and above, right? So 
plenty of uh, of mobility, right? And that's what the refractory elements add. They add stability mostly through the effect of uh, slowing diffusivity of lighter elements, titanium and chromium at 900, at 900 C. So the heavy refractory elements are put in there as uh, uh, to help stabilize and, uh, and slow things down. So solid solution strengthening is sort of a minor player. The strengthening by gamma prime, the age hardening, is really the, uh, the key aspect, right? So here the thing you need to keep in mind is strength as a function of the uh, particle size, right? And so here if we see hardness as a function of particle diameter, Right, these are the same curves that you saw before. They look like the over age, the aging curves in aluminum, right? It's the change in mechanism as we go from cutting to looping of the of the gamma prime particle. Right? So nothing new. Uh, nothing new here, right? right? But here's where we start to see some interesting things. So at small atomic percent aluminum, which means small volume fraction of gamma prime, we see something really interesting. So at low gamma prime fractions, we see what we expect, that the strength at colder temperatures is higher than the strength at elevated temperatures. Right. We would expect that the strength at 900 C is higher than the strength of it. But as we increase our gamma prime fraction, we see something really quite significant. Right. So at room temperature at 500, it follows the uh, sort of the the expected looping versus cutting or cutting versus looping profile at 900 C something weird happens and all of a sudden that 10 percent gamma prime fraction we're significantly stronger at elevated temperature than we are right which makes no sense in fact our strength at 900 C, it's actually well, it's a little hard to decouple because of the the various gamma prime volume fractions. But we can we can look at it at a constant gamma prime volume fraction, and we see something that looks like this. Like this is the the flow stress, right? And experimentally, we see a curve that looks like this as a function of temperature. Right. So, this is weird. Right? This is the anomalous strength behavior of super networks. So, where on earth is this coming from? Any speculation? I'm going to pick on Alejandro because he's Professor Mills' group. Yeah, but you're surrounded by it, right? Well, I guess just in that volume fraction, how you want location. So it has definitely has to do with this location, but it's not necessarily. Well, there's. A mechanism that involves locks. Well, I feel that the point of it is that like after a certain point, change the deformation. There is a there is a mechanism change, right? 
but the mechanism change needs to be such that it becomes harder at higher temperatures, right? So it needs to have a temperature dependence that makes it stronger. So let's start out by thinking about uh, dislocations in the gamma prime, right? So in FCC, our common, our common hull dislocations are the, the one half 110 defects that we all, all love because of the stacking fault energy of nickel, right? We're going to tend to separate into partials, right? Into our into two Shockley partials, right? Which the reaction two one six two one uh, two one one types plus a stacking fault, right? An intrinsic stacking fault. So if we Consider our L12 structure. We mentioned that because it's an ordered compound, right? The one half one one O defect coming, dislocation coming through is going to move a nickel atom onto the aluminum site, the aluminum atom onto the two. Uh, the nickel site, right, which forms a uh, anti-phase boundary, right? We have a planar fault where all the where we now have an atomic mismatch at all the all the sites along that uh, along that fault, right? Okay, so we need basically two shears to bring this back to back. Back through, right? So we need two uh, one half one one zero dislocations to come through, right? Which we indicate as a one one zero, a full uh, one one zero dislocation in the gamma prime. So we can call these 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 full one half one one low FCC dislocations become super partials in the uh, or super lattice partial dislocations in the uh, L one two structure, right? And so experimentally, we see these in TEM. Right, so here's the pair, the two sets, the leading and trailing pair of the one half uh, one one o's, and in between them is the APD. Right. And so here we sort of have our right. Remember our. Uh, Shockley partial, so an FCC, right? We can dissociate a one half one one o into two two Shockley partials, right? So each of these super partials can dissociate into a pair of Shockley-like partials, right? But now instead of just producing an intrinsic stacking fault like it does in FCC, it becomes much more complicated. We have a change in chemical environment and we produce a complex stacking fault. Oh, so that got a little wonky out of position here. All right, so the reaction is, here's the full 110, right? It's going to disassociate into two one half, one one of super parcels with an anti phase boundary, right? But then these one half one one oh FCC dislocations can become Shockley parcels, right? So now we have uh, for this to go through, we now have a Shockley partial. 
sharply partial dose do give us a complex stacking fault. Another one comes through and that has a, now we have an APP boundary. And then we need two more <laughs> partials to come through before we're back to our regular atomic position. And this is why, um, but you can imagine these complex stacking faults are high energy, high energy structures. And given the um, relatively low stacking fault energy of nickel, it's not uncommon for a, tra a leading partial to go through, leave behind a complex stacking fault, and become decorrelated with the trailing partial. Right? The trailing partial can never catch up with it, has other interactions with this and get stuck, leaving behind this uh, uh, this fault. Yeah. So this is because uh, nickel and aluminum atoms, obviously, they don't want to be on each other's sides. Yeah. And that's the antiphase boundary. That's what they, what we were talking about with just two stacking faults earlier, a simple yeah. case, uh, <laughs> that was just with a general FCC metal. Right? Yeah, so here, this is, this is whole FCC dislocations, right? Which are super lattice partials in the gamma prime, right? Because remember the gamma prime, right? The motif is this atom plus these three, right? So a full uh, dislocation in the gamma prime will take this nickel for this nickel. But an FCC dislocation will only take this nickel for this one. Right, and so that's going to leave behind this the safety Right, but the that's a little bit of a simple picture because in reality nickel's low stacking fault. So these one half one one o's exist as shocky partials that may and the leading and trailing partials because the stacking fault energy are going to be far apart from each other. And this defect equation is the same one just. Reduced as the one on the next one. It's the same one as the next one, except all we did is we we took these one half one one o's, split them into one six two one ones, right, and then thought about what happens as each one of those one six two one ones go through, right, and basically with one of them going through, you mm -hmm. don't have an APB boundary. You end up with a complex stack. If you get its trailing, get the get the paired shock of the partial that goes through, then you're then you have an APB, right? The geometry of this, if you look at where the atoms go, is really confusing, right? You gotta remember that most of the time right, we always study these perfectly clean dislocation structures, but when you actually look at what dislocations are there in the microscope. In micrographs, and you look at the atom positions, they're never perfect one half, one one oh, right? Even in aluminum, right? They're, they're, they're weird, they interact. To find them, do you have to use a Thompson tetrahedron? Well, so the Thompson tetrahedron tells you which ones are gonna, right? Which pairs you're going to have with the two one one type, um, yeah, partials. Yeah, and, and if you um, get into, you know, Professor Mills, who studies Cretan superalloys very extensively, right? If you look at the, the mechanisms and the faults that he sees, right, you see really complicated dislocation randoms. You have to form uh, some alloys form twins as a result of these, so they get. Uh, partial that goes through and then an atomic rearrangement and then you get another two that come through that gives you a local HCP structure which then grows which can then grow if you get two of those near each other with another shuffle you can grow into a twin and you get these extended planar twins that go through so the mechanisms become insanely complicated um, and and as sad as says this is sort of the simplest picture right this is one perfect this is this is how we go from uh, Shockley partials in the FCC to a, a full step, a full dislocation in the gamma prime. Right? Now, is this just deformation at room temperature? This is just deformation. We haven't gotten to the gotten to how this can, how we get strength additional strength at higher temperatures. Right? That's 
that's beginning the the next, right? So we know that in the gamma prime, right, that our yields that are right, we know there's nothing in FCC, right? Metals, pure FCC metals that is going to give us the strength increase. Otherwise, we would have seen it in aluminum. Right? We'd all be flying around in aluminum aircraft engines if we had strength increase. But we don't. So we know it has something to do with the gamma prime, right? And we need to think of some activation or deformation phenomena that's going to uh, increase in strength with additional thermal energy, right? So it's some mechanism that is energetically favorable that makes it harder for dislocation to move. And it's going to become more and more, more energetically favorable as you go up in temperature. Okay, so, right, cross slip, right? I mean, if we think about what, what becomes easier with temperature, we think about dislocations, right? Climb increases more with temperature, right? It's not obvious how climb will do this. Cross slip also becomes easier with temperature. Right. We might activate other dislocation modes. We might activate other slip modes. Remember, in, in BCC and HCT, we saw uh, other slip modes that became more prominent with temperature. Um, but for climb and the activation of other modes, we didn't don't see any evidence of that in the microscopy. Right. So that sort of leads uh, cross slip. Right. So how can how can cross slip uh, help here? So basically, here in Billsdorf um, came up with a theory that says these dissociated superpartials, right? The one half one one zero full dislocations in FCC superpartials in gamma prime. Can cross slip from the 111 plane onto an 001 plane. So let's just think about FCC for a second here, right? 011 contains the 110 direction as well, right? So the Burgers vector doesn't have to change if the dislocation can go from 111 to 001 in FCC. Right? And actually, experimentally, we sometimes do get 001 dislocations. They're not very, they're not mobile, but we we see them. Sometimes in, I think I may have mentioned that in shock deformation of aluminum, sometimes you get 011 slip. I mean 001 slip. Right? So we experimentally we see these dislocations. So it's not that strange. Uh, in experimentally we see them in FCC, so it's not that strange to think that they might occur in uh, the gamma prime. So we cross slip from a 111 type 111 plane to an 001 type plane. All right? Okay. Um, so we're transforming a mobile defect into a sessile defect. Why on earth would this happen? Right? All right? Remember, materials. These are like the great optimizers, right? They don't do anything unless it hits something, right? Right? So what um, Kier and Wilsdorf claimed is that the antiphase boundary energy is higher on 111 planes compared with that on the O planes. So we can reduce the the energy associated with the large, large fault, the antiphase boundary, by doing this, right? So what does this, what does this look like? So here we see the two super partials on one one one, cross slipping onto O O one. Right? The chiral stress on O O one is much higher. 
So once this cross slip event happens, it's much difficult, uh, much more difficult to uh, deform. So as the temperature increases, our tendency to cross slip is going to increase because we need thermal activation for this to happen, right? So the number of dissociations, dissociations, dislocations locked through this cross slip mechanism increases. And then we need significantly more stress applied to, to move these out of this configuration. Right? Okay. Yeah. Can you explain why the why um it becomes harder to move them on the lower one plane? So you're still your burgers vector is still in the same direction. So yeah. One one oh. But why is it harder to move? So the pyral stress. So one one one, right? So the close packed one 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 planes are farther apart. Right? Right, you're on a non close packed plane, right? They're close to the planes, the 1 1, the 1 0 closer together. Right, higher pyral stress to move defects on the non close packed, the non close packed plane. Right, take a look at the geometry of it, so sort of sketch it out. It's it's worthwhile. It's a question that actually a lot of people ask. I get at least once a year in the graduate mechanical behavior class. We'll talk about, we'll talk about uh, defects. So one thing that important to note, right, that the separation of these partials is higher on the O O one plane than it is on the. One one one, right? Because of the uh, uh, strain energy effects, right? And this. Okay. okay, so now at temperatures above, so that that explains why it gets harder as we increase temperature. But then why does it drop again? Right. Basically. The more temperature we give this, the more mobile these dislocations come. So eventually, we get to a temperature where we have enough thermal activation that the effective pyral stress of this becomes low enough that we can begin to, to collide these dislocations. Okay, so that's the theory. So... What are the problems with it? So, the PPV model, Hydar, Pope, and Vitek, uh, studied this experimentally, and they came up with a couple of uh, problems. Somehow my thing has got all screwed up. So, for the this cure Gilsdorf mechanism to work, as part of the original theory, we needed the stacking fault energy for the production of an APV on 111 to be much higher than, than 001. So when they actually measured these stacking fault energies, eh, it turns out that's not the case. It's only slightly higher, right? So you have to do a more in-depth elastic analysis, right? And take into account the, anti the elastic anisotropy Right. All remember all the dislocation calculations that that we did in this class and you did in previous classes and even in the graduate mechanics class. We assume a isotropic elastic medium, right? And so the the typical picture of a stress field around a dislocation assumes elastic uh, isotropy. If you go the much more difficult route and calculate what these things look like elastically and isotropically. 
calculate the elastic fields around the neighbor in it, a neighborhood, you see that uh, the the picture in gamma prime changes very significantly, right? And basically, it's not the stacking fault energy, but it's the elastic strain energy associated with these partials, right? That by cross slipping onto the 001 plane and off the 111 planes, we uh, can uh, reduce the energy. And specifically, right, that we get a, essentially a torque. From the interaction of the partials that encourages this, this cross slip, right? They're not, there's a moment associated with the, the interaction, the elastic interactions associated with the two partial dislocations in this anisotropic medium that you don't see if you just do the elastic, the elastic or the isotropic fluctuation, right? So basically, right, it's it's this elastic anisotropy uh, that causes these these locks these locks to appear, right? And to move uh, right, you got sort of confusing, right? So we got the, everything's cross slip, we've got this torque on these defects which give us these local sort of uh, Dis, displacements around the the uh, defect to call that when they're on the, the the 100 planes, right? In order to get them to move, we have to apply a force that undoes that torque so that they can so that they can move, right? And so this requires uh, uh, energy, thermal energy, and as we go up in temperature, eventually we have enough thermal energy for this to happen and we can uh, permit the glider at this location. So the key thing here is I don't expect anyone, I'm, I'm only touching this a very complicated uh, topic very lightly, right? The key idea here is that the this anomalous strengthening in uh, super alloys comes from the interactions of the super partials and the cross slip, right? And that the exact reason for the cross slip is this elastic anisotropy, and that eventually you're going to get to a high enough temperature, higher temperature, more cross slip. But as you keep increasing the temperature, eventually you're going to have enough thermal energy to the partials that you need. Right. So that's the the general uh, the general flow. Right. So this just shows a couple different uh, at gamma at different gamma prime fractions. Right, what the uh, flow stress versus temperature looks like. You can see if we have full, if we're fully gamma prime, right, we have a, a huge effect, right? And then disc alloys that are 60 to 80 uh, percent, essentially gamma prime, right, we get these very large increases in, in strength, right? And this is. This picture is basically the reason we use super alloys as for turbine discs. We get incredibly high strengths at sizable fractions of the melting point. Okay. So that's just the dislocation going through. Right, but remember when we talked about precipitate hardening or particle hardening, we talked about a whole bunch of different effects. Right? We have modulus effects, we have coherency strains, right? The 
the strength of the gamma prime in the ATD, fault energy, are only part of it. Right? We still have all the other uh, precipitation strengthened uh, mechanisms, right? And just a reminder of the de defect. So basically, even if we do pass all that through and we get back to the regular order, right, we get a lot of strength because of the mechanisms the particles are going to cut. Single dislocations basically can't cut through easily, right? What happens is the first dislocation sits there and waits until the other one comes, comes up. Right, and then they cut as a pair, right? So this is where we don't produce that, uh, the APB, right? So, but essentially we have a pileup behavior, right? So if we have two one half one one zero dislocations on the same slip plane, they're gonna have the same basic, the same sign, right? So there's a repulsion that's going to need to be overcome between these two, uh, one half one one oh dislocations in the FCC, even though there's an attraction in the gamma prime because the super particles never have right. So for cutting right the APB hardening effect, this antiphase boundary hardening effect is going to increase the volume fraction of gamma prime. That makes sense, right? The more that we have right the size, how big these faults are going to be for particles, and the actual energy of the uh, the faulted surface. Okay. Right. And then we also get, in addition to all this, we also get solid solution strengthening in the gamma prime as well. Okay. So we've got a huge um, number of mechanisms all happening at the same time, right, that are contributing to the, uh, the strength of the alloy. Right? We just sort of run through them. We've got strengthening in uh, solid solution strengthening in the gamma. We've got the complex dislocation interactions with the gamma prime. We've got the misfit of the gamma prime. We've got the modulus of the gamma prime. We've got chemical strengthening from the formation of the APB at boundaries. We've got um, uh, production of steps on the interface on the surface. So we're producing greater gamma gamma prime interface as this location cuts, cuts through, right? So all of these mechanisms are at play. Basically everything in that first lecture on strengthening occurs plus significantly more due to the fact that we're got it, we're going from a FCC into an ordered structure. Okay. So now we get into wonder why that page was wrong. So we had mentioned that uh was the come on to this sort of didn't think I'd quite get to here. Yeah, so I'm actually going to I'll push on for a couple more minutes. I expected that to take a little bit, a little bit longer. Okay, so creep, as we had mentioned, is our primary one of our primary design constraints, right? We said creep and low cycle fatigue, right? And at high temperatures. Our creep strength in 
discs, we said was largely governed by dislocations. I mean, not just grain boundaries, right? So we want large grains uh, for creep strength and small grains for low cycle fatigue. In a disc, we only have, it's a single crystal, right? So we don't have any grain boundaries. So the creep strength is governed by the intrinsic mechanisms, right, of what's going on, right? And at very elevated temperatures, that's going to be diffusion creep, right? At much at lower temperatures, it's going to be dislocation creep. So the dislocations are going to have to uh, um, cut through, but we don't have a very a huge driving, right? A, a, a huge stress, right? We're not implying. I mean, there's large loads because it's a spinning, spinning thing, but it's not like we're squishing it in a compression test, right? The loads are are lower than what would cause normal plastic flow. Um, so this is sort of you know we're we're talking creep. So this is the long time. Uh, behavior. So we have to consider uh, that now we have to think about the thermal um, migration due to diffusion, right? So dislocation, climb, and uh, diffusion creep, right? So from an alloying point of view, elements that alloying elements that are going to slow the diffusivity of key strengtheners are going to uh, further provide further strengthening, right? And so this is our uh, refractories, molybdenum, cancelite, niobium, tungsten, right? Is that just because they're really heavy? Yeah, they're just, they're very slow diffusers, and the chemical neighborhood likes to stay constant, right? So the faster moving ones don't like to really do too much without, without those, right? Just, you've got this minimum sort of energy when you've got the alloying elements sort of all together. It's sort of a hand waving argument, but it's good enough for good enough for what we want uh, uh, here, right? We also have to think about the, as I mentioned, the, we have coherency strains, right? At the uh, due to the mismatch of lattice parameter at the uh, at the interface, right? Remember, the, the lower the misfit, the easier cutting is going to be, right? It's perfect. It's very easy for dislocation to go through a perfectly coherent interface versus a fully incoherent interface, right? And so here we can see that we basically have a linear relationship between uh, mismatch and, and hardness. So, again, the equation is here more for your reference, right? You're not going to be expected to use this on an exam or anything. Um, but right, some simple models for the increase in the CRSS arriving from the coherency strains. Right, and this is very similar to the equation that we talked about during the strengthening, the strengthening uh, chapter, right, where our epsilon is epsilon to the three halves. That's our difference in uh, mismatch, right? That's the strain that arises, right? our mean particle diameter, and the volume fraction of the gamma product, right? So those are the key things that go into the strengthening effect, right? 
or the four things. So we got shear modulus, the strain, the this is the Berger's vector, right? How big of a shear we need to make, the particle size and the volume fraction, right? This is all under the square root, right? This is raised to the, the three halves power. So the strain and the shear modulus are the two biggest uh, contributor, right? So the theory is going to predict that as the magnitude of the coherency strain increases, the volume fraction increases and the particle size of the fraction increases. We're going to increase increase our strength. Okay. So basically we can't play with this too too much. Um, in a lot of alloys uh, because of our compositional uh, limitations, right? So if you notice that our ones with the high coherency strains, like this is sort of our effective alloying uh, effect, these 718, these tend to be low gamma prime fraction uh, um, alloys. Right. And this is sort of the effect, this goes through the effect of each of the alloying elements on the uh, coherency strains on the misfit, right? So titan titanium and niobium, right? Partition into the gamma prime, expanding the, the lattice parameter in the gamma prime. Chromium, molybdenum, and iron decrease coherency strains, right, by partitioning to the matrix, right? So they're going to partition to the matrix, expand the gamma lattice parameter to make it match better with the gamma prime, right? This is why, I mean, compositionally, we don't have a, a large amount to play with, right? We can't just throw things in because. The system is going to partially self-correct, right? Because we're going to have these things, potential uh, elements that if they were not <coughs> subject to a high misfit would, would potentially stay more in the gamma prime, but because, because of the ability to reduce energy, they're going to segregate out into the gamma and increase the lattice parameter, right? Nickel substitutions for iron and chromium right, increase the, the coherency strains, right? So as iron and chrome come out, we shrink the, the lattice parameter in our gamma prime. Cobalt is pretty neutral. Tantalum behaves like niobium and tungsten and molybdenum, right? And remember the cross effects, right? These are the same guys that we said contribute to strengthening by slowing diffusion, right? But right, this is going to give us a low uh, a low misfit. Right. And remember the lattice parameters that we're talking about are, are you know the changes are not super significant. We're talking about going from 352 to 356, right? So the misfit strains are are fairly small, right? Even going from from uh, 3.52 angstroms to 3.6 angstroms, right? That's at the far range. You can have fairly high percent changes, but at the lower end, you can have very very good coherency between the gamma and the gamma prime. Right. Okay. Again, the other effect was is modulus mis mismatch, right? Remember the dislocation strain energy. The rule of thumb is whenever you have dislocation and energy, right? GB squared, whenever we're solving any dislocation problems. Right. And so uh
right? If we have a 40% change in flow stress due to modulus effects, what does that tell you about the relative effect of uh, the relative shear, uh, shear modulizers, right? Significantly higher in the gamma prime than in the, the gamma, and uh, then it larger particle sizes when we can't cut or when we have large interparticle separation, right? We move into a looping regime. And this is the similar equation that we saw in the original strengthening chapter, right? The effect of uh, particle size and separation, right? So basically, the way we can get increased strength if we took the move the particles closer together, right? we reduce the inner particle spacing, it's going to make looping that much more difficult. So the same as everything else, right? If we get a relatively fine dispersion of high volume fractions with the particles close together, right? We're going to be at our optimal optimal. Uh, uh, condition for hardening. Right. And I think we will uh, stop there because that gets me into climb recovery, which is sort of a different different topic that I can't quite hit in, in the 30 seconds we have left. Okay, see everyone Friday. We'll wrap up the last couple slides on strengthening and hit applications.